Hi everybody, uh, thanks for coming. Um, this is the 20 minute introduction to CouchDB, which is something that's totally unlike what this rest of the conference is about. So you can bear with me. Uh, first order of, uh, no, uh, first couple of questions. Um, who here has heard about CouchDB? That's a lot of people. Well, who is using CouchDB? That's it. Like that. Thank you. <laughs> cool. So, um, the first order of business is you should relax because that's a recurring topic in CouchDB. So when you actually start up CouchDB on the command line, it will say CouchDB has started, time to relax. So that's all I'll maintain here. Uh, like three sentences about me. My name is Jan Lehnert. That's my email address. If you have any questions that you want to ask me afterwards but can't think of afterwards, just send me an email or contact me on Twitter if you like. Um, I've been doing open source work, um, a lot of MySQL and PHP stuff for a lot of years. And uh, then I sort of stumbled into CacheDB and that's where I'm now. And I'm uh, director of a company called Cache.io and this stuff is outdated. <coughs> Never mind. Um, so that guy, Damien Katz, the original author of CacheDB, so I can't claim all the, the coding uh, fame. Um, CacheDB, uh, nah, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but keep that picture in mind. He's, that, he's a brain behind CacheDB. Um, that's the agenda for today. and. Um, I can like zoom that up to, to from 20 minutes to 60 minutes to three hours to three days, and um, the trick from going from 60 minutes to 20 minutes is just speaking faster. So um, if you can't understand what I'm saying, please raise a hand, correct, or like, ask me to re um, say something again. Turn off that phone, please. Um, okay, let's go. Um, the first thing that you learn about CacheDB is that schema free. You don't go in and define any tables, columns, data types, um, anything what you're used to when you write uh, application for relation database. Uh, instead, you just store JSON objects what, that we call documents. Um, the cool thing about JSON is, like everybody knows JSON, like don't make a raise of hands thing because you all know JSON. Um, it represents all the native data types you have in your programming language, and it gets rid of impedance mismatch between having data objects in your application, you know, programming, object-oriented programming, and the like, table structure um, that you have in the data store. Um, and this sort of lets you get rid of any object, object, uh, object relational mappers um, that bridge between these two worlds. So uh, this is like the first thing you can relax on. You don't need to think of any schema, just store stuff in it. Uh, all major languages support serialization from objects into JSON and back, and it's even like cross-language compatible. So it actually does something that XML promised but didn't deliver. So you can take a Java object, or say a Python object, turn it into JSON, and you serialize it into a Ruby or PHP object and work with it. Um, the, there are a few things that are special about um, documents that, that CacheDB uses. Uh, there are the things with an underscore here. The, uh, the first two things, the, the very first thing is the ID, sort of the primary key for a record. Um, if you st if you store a document in CacheDB or an object in CacheDB, CacheDB will generate a UUID for you and give that back to you. If you ask CacheDB for the object that's associated with a UUID, you get your object back. Um, that's a very simple concept. Think again. Think of it as a pr primary key for your record. Um, the second thing is the rev, which we call revision or revision number, revision ID. Um, it's sort of like in revision control where you have multiple versions of, a, of an item. So in CouchDB, you don't go in and say, go to that record with that ID, go to the H field and bump that to 64, or I don't know, add whatever, add a headware. Um, but you create an entire new representation of that object and store that complete document over, or object document, are interchangeable here, um, over the old version. And when you change a new one, or create a new one, a new version of one document, you get a new revision ID. Now, why do that? Um, CacheDB uses multi-version concurrency control to avoid any locking on write. So when you write to a document, you must know the latest revision that's stored in the document store. Um, MVCC is used in a lot of like, storage engines that are inside the database, and CacheDB exposes that MVCC pattern to the, to the client. So the, the programmer has to do a little more work to deal with these uh, um, um, potentially not allowable writes. So when you when you, read, like, when you want to change a document in CacheDB, you go in and patch it, change your field, or whatever in it, save it back. Now, if you still have the 
the revision that's attached to me, all is well, you know, change gets saved. If somebody else did the same and would go to catch me faster, the latest re revision will be a, a different one. And the one that you're trying to save will not match the one that's now in cache to be, and your right will be denied. So you need to update again, merge again, uh, merge and then write again. Um, again, it's a little more work for the programmer, but no locking. And that's kind of nice if you run into concurrent concurrency. Um, and concurrency is something that we'll get back to in a minute. Um, the rest is whatever you want to put in there. Can be just one field, couple of fields, arrays, booleans. Can be big, can be small, whatever you need. Just store it in there. Don't don't think about or not that much about like organizing your data against the database. Just store your data as it occurs. Um, now for the programmers, um, how to think in in um, document oriented databases? Because it took me about three four months. To get all that SQL knowledge out of my out of my brain to understand how to work with document-oriented databases, it's not that easy if you're really like tied into the traditional way of doing things. Um, the idea of storing documents comes from how we as humans deal with documents like in the real world. Everything we have on paper, text forms, bills, receipts, whatever, um, and all that this data that we we use in the real world, and then we like we usually write software to make our lives easier. That to transform and like real world data into computer data, and why not transform the same properties that, that real world data adds into the database? So the first thing to see is the same types, not the same structure. Uh, the example is the address book, um, not the address book entry, which the real world part is the um, the business card. I don't have a fax machine. My business card doesn't say fax equals null. That makes no sense. Why would I put? Why would I do that? Um, Whereas you might have a fax, and your business card would say fax so and so. So we have the same type of data, but it has a different structure, and that's an attribute of natural or real world data, natural data. Um, that is something that can actually be supports, which is nice. Um, second thing can be out of date. So if you give me, if I give you my business card and switch jobs, you have something that is out of date. This is something you should usually try to avoid in the relational database. But we as humans can deal with it. So I might have like real world mail forwarding set up that if you send me a letter, it gets forwarded to my new address. My phone might still work, or they might be redirected, my old email might still work again. Or I might actually <coughs> try to uh, deliberately cut ties with you. Like I like all you guys, so I don't do that. And you get all my new business cards when the redirects, but um, that's something that I might want in the real world. So that's support again. And the last thing is no references. Every document is self contained. If I get a receipt from a company or uh, um, from from the restaurant I went to, everything that that's needed for for this document is actually on that piece of paper. The address, and the items I bought, the total. There's no points to other places where I can look up the data. So that's something again that is uh, different from relational databases. Sorry. Um, to summarize that, we call this natural data behavior. So um, we take how we, as humans, you deal with data and just turn for all that into the database. That's how you can like, develop, think about it. That, that didn't supposed to happen. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, next step. Uh, Finally, concurrent. Uh, who here knows Erlang, the program manager Erlang? That's not so many people. Cool. Um, so Erlang is worth its own talk or conference. Um, and I'll talk about the conference a bit in a bit. Um, so, Erlang is a functional programming language that comes on its own virtual machine and is, was originally designed for tel telco applications. <coughs> the design is 20 years old and there's a successful um, commercial application for it in the telco world. Um, turns out the problems they solved in the telco world back then are the same problems we have on the web now. We have customers or users on our site that are there 24 7. There's no like, downtime when I can do maintenance things. Um, a lot of things go on at the same time, and it should be that if there's one pre request going, there's a problem with that request, none of the other requests should be affected. Um, that's something that I was designed for. Um, so there's, it's got parallelism built, built into the language. It's very easy to build concurrent applications that run on multiple machines, make good use of multiple cores, <coughs> and a lot of cores. Um, right, that's the next point. Um, and it's very easy, it's got a set of standard libraries that makes it very easy to build fault-tolerant systems. So 
you build a lot of components, or your, your programs are a lot of components, and you have a supervision tree that looks at that component, dies, restart it, um, do a lot of things with that. That's, that's all been industry strength um, components or things that you can build good stuff with. The next slide is a little bit about, uh, it's a bragging slide, it's really nice. Um, it shows an Apache versus yours. It's Apache 2.0, so it's a little old, and yours is sort of an Apache 2 clone in Erlang. And what this shows is um, transactions, no, not transactions, kilobytes per second for a concurrent request. So we see that the, the green and the blue one are Apache, the red one is yours, and this is concurrent connections. So we've got, I think, 800, I think, um, kilobytes a second going out of there, so it's been a little old. And Apache crabs out it's under and under 10,000 concurrent connections, while your they just stop the, the benchmark at over 80,000 concurrent connections with yours. So while a lot of people here, I think, focus on getting the most of a single machine in terms of speed, well, and and does actually tries to get the most of a machine in terms of concurrency. And the trade-off here is that you can throw as much load up on a single machine and it will not fall over all of your office latency. So if you get a lot more requests, it will get slow for everybody. So you can like, catch spikes a lot easier than just like, getting losing your losing your machine. Um, talking to Cache TV, uh, we thought it's a good idea to use a protocol that everybody knows already. And I see so easy, my mom knows it, and she's not a technical person. Um, so everything Cache TV has a re um, has an ad a URL, yeah, an address. Um, we think about it as, as resources, the standard operations we do on the data item that create, read, update, and delete are very well um, uh, represented by the HTTP methods, get put and delete, and it turns out that everybody who is really, who is doing anything of significance already knows how to talk HTTP, there are a lot of libraries, a lot of support. Um, so it's very easy to, to uh, for developers to get into because they already know how HTTP works, so that's one point where the developers can relax. They don't need like special uh, uh, libraries to connect with their favorite programming languages, and then the underlying client libraries are out of date and I don't know, a lot of headaches. HTTP has like two versions; they're both very well supported. Uh, the other, the other way is, uh, well, the other good thing about HTTP is that your operations people uh, are already very aware or very familiar with dealing with HTTP servers. So they scale your patches or whatever you have on the front, and with proxies and caches and load balancing and failover and all that, they all know the infrastructure. There's a lot of infrastructure out there, and you can just put that in front of cache and it just works. So I should actually not use the quotes, it just works. Um, so if you need some load balancing, put an nginx that makes, for example, round robin um, backend requests. Uh, if you need, I don't know, there's a lot of things you can do in HTTP, and you don't need specialized software. So you guys have, or Jan Kineski did the uh, MySQL proxy, and it's so cool. But they actually, or you had to go in, or the MySQL people had to go in and write a specialized proxy for just MySQL protocol. Whereas we can use all the available proxies that we have in HTTP already. So your operations people already know how to scale HTTP, and they can take all the infrastructure from scaling web servers to scaling the database, and they'll be very happy to have less moving parts. Um, that's three lines of Ruby, or four, um, that show how easy it is to program CouchDB. First line is just point to a CouchDB database that we want to write to. Um, the next one <coughs> defines the URL where you can get a user's timeline from Twitter in JSON. You make a get request to that URL, and then make a bulk save request to CouchDB with the tweets you just got, and all <coughs> individual tweets will end up as single documents in your, in your CouchDB database. This is actual working code from a project that a friend of mine did that's creating Twitter for stuff. Um, that is very simple to do things and to get up to get speed. So that's relaxing again. Um, so it's time doing. Not very good. So we have a <coughs> sort of revision multi-version concurrency control object store. Um, but that's not much of a database. So you can, we, we've got views, and they're powered by MapReduce. Who is familiar with MapReduce? It's the thing that, that made Google so successful. Um, so to make queries <coughs> fast, what you can do with views is you provide, the program that provides cache to with a map and reduce function that gets run through all documents. The map function filters 
the document for the data you want to index it for. So you can create secondary indexes with your views. Views are sorted by that key, so you get collation, and you get key operations on that, on that in, uh, index operations on that, that index. So you can uh, very quickly look up things like uh, give me everything from 2008 or from 2008, 2009, or this range, or all these operations are very fast. They are BG uh, backed on disk. Um, the cool thing is it's incremental. So if you change something in CouchDB, the view engine is smart enough to only integrate the changes that are that happen in the database and integrate them into the index instead of indexing all the data again. So the first query to, to your CouchDB view will be a little slower. It is equivalent to an alter table, or if you add a, add a column, an alter table statement, so that it takes a while. But once it's indexed, um, all changes that happen in CouchDB will be indexed very quickly and on this update time, very, very fast. And the reduced part is um, you can actually make calculations. So if you need sums, averages, or any other fancy calculations that you want to do with your data, that's where you can use the reduce, and there's a lot more features that are not going to need to uh, go into the time. Um, last one is replic last but two one for replication. So you've got this very cool database server, and uh, we know there will be a lot of problems, like machines die, there's, you know, Things, things go wrong. Uh, so you want a second couch. Um, and the traditional model is you have a master database, you replicate to the slave database, and when the slave database, or when the master dies, the slave takes over, or the backup takes over. Um, you can use the same architecture for read scaling. You have a lot of uh, few writes, a lot of reads. You make a bunch of read slaves. That's the architecture you should be all familiar with. Um, couch DB replication doesn't work at all like MySQL replication. It might be a little more robust because of it. Um, CacheDB replication is inherently multi-master, so you cannot only have one master or two masters, but any number of masters. Every CacheDB instance is a master database, so you can uh, set up like cool clusters. They all replicate back and forth, and if one of them dies, you have your maybe have uh, your HTTP like the HA proxy or have IP failover, so that your clients will never know that that couch died. Um, replication works in that you uh, maybe do that in the question. But um, you can get very fancy with the, with the architecture if you really want to. Um, say the, the above three couches are your, your San Francisco data center, <coughs> this is your New York data center, and they work for redundancy, and there's redundant connections between that, and everybody has like a local copy, but they can also replicate between different, different locations. And the ultimate idea is to have a couch on every device. So I have my address book on my phone, on my laptop, on my home computer, my work computer, and it would be really nice if I could share all that information I put into one device with all the others without actually going to the, to the cloud. Everybody says the cloud is a cool thing, but it, it requires a network connection. That's where the, that, that's a problem with network connection. Yeah, when you really need them, they're not available or too pricey. <laughs> um, last one, robust, robust storage. CacheDB has no panel only file storage. Uh, each database server can host multiple databases, just like any other database, and each database lives in a single file that gets dependent to only. So CacheDB never overrides any data. Uh, when CacheDB has committed data to disk, it's guaranteed to be in a consistent state. So when CacheDB crashes, or a machine crashes, power goes away, whatever happens, if you start CacheDB again, it doesn't have to do a consistency check. Everybody that had to wait, had to wait for a week for my ISM check is very happy to see that. <laughs> Sorry for the bashing. It's just so easy. Um, <laughs> um, one design principle of Erlang is it's designed to crash. Um, I could, that catch if it doesn't have an off knob. You just you don't, you don't turn it off, you don't shut it down, you just like, come, like kill the process, it's gone. When you start up, it starts up again. Very easy. So it's got that like, design to crash and it's on. The, the trade off here is, of course, um, disk space, everything gets appended to a file. Eventually, your file is so big that it can't be handled, and that's where. Um, compaction comes in. Compaction is the same as vacuum and Postgres or SQLite, a maintenance process that you're running um, periodically to keep um, keep your data sizes small. Um, there's a few resources. I'll put the, the slides up. Uh, you, you might, uh, you will find them. CacheDB is on Twitter. It's on the official our page. It's CacheDB org. It's an Apache project. It's a release on the Apache 2.0 license. So that's pretty nice. Uh, we've got a shop that you can get very fancy T-shirt that I've failed to bring one. <laughs> We've got a planner with all the blog posts. There's an extensive two-hour talk with all the technical details on this URL. The screencast is if you happen to do Rails. 
Um, next week will be Cash Be Factory in Palo Alto. So if you like what you hear, then we've got a special offer. It's, it's an Allen conference, but all of Friday is a special Cash To Be day. So we've got Cash To Be content all day. And if you go to this URL, you will get a special discount and a, and a uh, uh, access for just that one day for the Allen conference for the Cash To Be content if you want to come. It's in Palo Alto, just around the corner, and you can hang out with us and relax. Um, last but not least, I run a consultancy company called Couch.io. We do um, support um, consulting, development, and hosting. If you're interested in Couch.io hosting, we've got a like, private beta running. I can get you an invite. Um, if you need any consulting, let me know. Thank you. database and use a remote database or target database which can be local or remote or both remote and it says move everything from, from A to B and kind of then goes like our sim does that. If you want to have bidirectional replication you just trigger the reverse thing. If you want to have continuous replication there's a notification system in Couch that you can subscribe. So when you say you trigger it do you mean the application, the actual application that's using the Couch TV or is it some separate process? Uh, whatever you need. You can It can be front up, it can be an update notification. Uh, um, client, it can be the application itself, doesn't matter. And how do you how do you handle uh, version conflicts on multiple masters? Uh, good question. Uh, conflict. Uh, Couchbase has a conflict det detection system. So if two uh, two documents get changed on two two databases at the same time before replication, replication will detect that there is a conflict, and in the distributed system, data being in conflict is a natural state, so you can't avoid it. Couchbase doesn't try to hide that from you because that's a bad idea. Um, so what happens is the, your JSON document will get a new member underscore conflicts, which shows all revisions that are in that conflict, and multiple revisions can be in that conflict. And Couch2B will deterministically pick one of these revisions to be the winning revision. If you query that object of the document, you will get back that revision, but losing revision will be stored in separate uh, well, as, as uh, previous revisions or as alternate revisions. So you, the application, or some maintenance process has to go in and resolve the conflict. Could you explain that deterministically? Uh, it's, um, I can explain, but you shouldn't rely on that. Okay. So, CacheDB picks one winner. The only guarantee it makes in a cluster of CacheDB, if you have like 10, cluster, uh, 10 machines running CacheDB and everybody replicates to everybody, it's guaranteed that everybody comes up with the same winning revision. So you have cluster-wide data consistency. And you, when you resolve that, everybody gets the same result. And that's, in the future, we want to make it that um, the application can provide a, an algorithm to pick the latest revision for one customer. We're doing a timestamp based, like whatever is latest wins, but that's not a generic solution, so we cannot put it into a cache but that's an application thing. But timestamp of which clock? Yeah, right. They have they have a data center a synchronization clock. They can rely on clock. But usually in distributed system, just that when conflict is natural, there's no clock. We shouldn't rely on that. So that's again not a generic solution. So that should be gives you the tools to deal with conflict, which is something you need to be aware of if you have, if you have one that, more than one computer um, to deal with them. And you cannot just pretend that it's not there. <coughs> more questions? The back. Okay, you, okay. I think I'm gone. You can grab me outside. Thanks.